I'm Rachel Foss. I'm the Senior Policy Advisor at reInvent Albany. Um, since it's not that many of us, I'd love to know where people are coming from and what your interest in the freedom of information law and how to use it is. And I have one big question, which is, has anyone in this room, room done a freedom of information request before? Yeah, one, two. Ah, okay. So good. This is the place for you because it's not that hard. And you don't have to be a lawyer, contrary to popular belief, to actually get public records through the state's freedom of information law. I'm going to focus pretty much on New York State law, but it's pretty similar at the other levels of government um, or at the federal level. It's a little bit easier to get records, actually. So I think in some ways, if your base of understanding is New York, if you can manage New York, you can probably manage other places because New York's freedom of information law is worse than other places. So that's my uh, suggestion. Okay. I have other states. What's that? You, you were making a joke that New York, you can do it in New York, you can do it in Edinburgh, including other states. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think my, my point is that, yeah, New York's, New York State's freedom of information law is very cumbersome and difficult. Mm. So if you feel like you learn how to do a FOIL freedom of information request in New York, you can probably do it anywhere else pretty well. So, okay. So first, a little bit about reInvent Albany, the organization I work for. Um, we advocate for transparent and accountable New York State and city government. Some of the areas we work on are obviously core to school data and open data week, open government, clean, accountable government, um, fact-based public investment, and then strong democracy. By that, we mean, you know, campaign finance reform and issues like that. So some of the things we've worked on, we do a lot to try to strengthen the law itself, the freedom of information law. So there's some examples of things we've been able to do to make it a little bit better. We haven't... Uh, made it so amazing yet that we're done trying, but so we've worked on making it easier to get attorney's fees, reduce the time um, for appeals, and then um, the bottom, we've been involved in a lot of the passage of open data laws at the city and state level, including most recently the MTA open data law. So what is FOIL? And uh, because it's 3.45 in the afternoon, and it's the last session of the day, I couldn't help but say, no, it is not the tinfoil hat you put on your head to protect you from government intrusion. Actually, we're trying to get government records. And the freedom of information law is really all about trying to make sure that you, as a member of the public, have access to public records that you pay for as a taxpayer. So New York's freedom of information law, anyone know when this law was first passed? Anyone want to take a guess? Boom, you got it, 1978, in the 1970s. So this law has been around for a long time um, with a lot of the sort of transparency laws, the post-Watergate scandal era. So the Freedom of Information Law has been around for a long time, but it's still pretty archaic, unfortunately, in terms of the way that the public can get records from the government. So first off, who, what entities are covered by the Freedom of Information Law in New York State? It's a, it's a state law, but I think it's worth emphasizing that it actually applies to local governments as well. So the state agencies, statewide elected officials, if you want to get records from the governor's office, it applies to public authorities. Public authorities are like the, the MTA or the um, Empire State Development. Um, it also applies to different boards and commissions and advisory bodies. And as I mentioned earlier, it applies to a lot of different bodies at the local level, too, throughout the state. So not just New York City government, but say you're trying to get records from a village in upstate New York, that would also be covered by the state's freedom of information law. And also, it does apply to certain nonprofits that are affiliated with state or city government, like Prospect Park Alliance, the Central Park Conservancy, things like that um, that people might not think of. Some nonprofits, if they have government representation on them, they might be covered by the Freedom of Information Law. Now, probably more importantly for you to know is what's not covered, so you're not um, trying to get records and failing to do so. Um, the state legislature has its own set of laws. <laughs> it 
you can get records from the state legislature, but it's it's a different standard. Um, and actually, interestingly enough, our former government governor, um, who shall not be named, used to veto bills the state legislature tried to pass for the agencies to make FOIL better on the premise that, well, you won't reform yourselves, legislature, so I'm going to veto these bills that would affect me. Um, in my experience, it's actually easier to get some records out of the state assembly than the state senate. That might surprise some of you, but it's just a, a note. Um, but I would say, you know, interestingly enough, the state legislature really doesn't get a lot of freedom of information requests. Something we've looked at as an organization is the caseload, how many freedom of information requests to each agency get. And the legislature doesn't get that much, about 100 each, um, probably because it's really hard to get records so people don't even try. Um, this was discussed on a couple of the earlier events. The judiciary is not in every aspect of is covered. It, decisions of individual judges, for example, are not covered by the Freedom of Information Law, but some records and uh, documents from the Office of Court Administration would be covered, just to flag for you all. Um, another area that's difficult in our experience is that if you're looking for records that relate to a consultant working for the gov government or a vendor, certain records you can get, but it's very hard in practice to get those because there are a lot of exemptions, unfortunately, in the law. So um, you all are here for School of Data, so you care about data, right? So I wanted to sort of pull out what the law says about what records are. So it's very, very, very broad in the state law. So it absolutely does include data. Um, it's records produced, held, filed by, with or for a state agency, right? So I'm not going to read this whole list, but what the law says about the types of records you can get is really, really, really broad. Um, but again, there are exemptions to that. So I'm going to run through this long list, which probably feels like a bit like a disclaimer about all the side effects of the drugs you want to take. These are the things you cannot get. You can't get um, private records of other people. You can get your own private records. You can't get records that are related to a contract award that hasn't been awarded yet or a union agreement that hasn't been made yet. Trade There are trade secret exemptions from vendors. Again, that's in part what makes it so hard to get records from consultants for state government, in part is from this trade secrets exemption. Um, if there's an ongoing investigation by the police or in the courts, uh, it's hard to get those records until the everything is concluded. Um, it's also hard to get records that are communications between government or internal to government. Um, this is called inter intra agency communications, which is a very confusing term. But I think the best way of thinking about this is, you know, records that are kind of seen as internal to an agency, but. I would say that there are exceptions to the exception, just to make the law extra confusing for us. Underlying data in these types of documents are avail is available. And I think that's really important for this audience when you're looking for data. If there's data in an agency's you know, internal communication that is about how they are providing services, you probably can get some of that information, even if the whole record itself might be exempt. Um, or if the record of the agency relates to, you know, how that agency is supposed to interact with the public, then you might be able to get some of that information. Or, you know, if it's a final policy, it probably should be public, even if it's an internal document. And then the last exception really is about records that relate to public safety. You know, post 9-11, there were a lot of, you know, national security, state security, you know, reasons for not releasing um, certain government records. Um, just as a note, something that is has been used in our experience with records is calling something a draft. It doesn't mean it's not a public record. An agency just can't slap draft across the top and say this can never be released. The law doesn't work like that, but it's something that's often used. Okay. 
So again, you all want to, you're here because you care about data. So how do you use the freedom information law to get data? And what does the law specifically say about data? Well, it actually has a provision about microfilm. Um, isn't that fun? So if you want to find your data on microfiche, you know, that's in the law. It's pretty clear. But the law is still pretty archaic. And while there's been some changes to it over the years about data, it's it still needs a bit of work. But nonetheless, if an agency has data, it has to retrieve it for you. Um, something that is a big frustration of a lot of folks who are trying to get data from government is, you know, you see a report, it's in a nice PDF, you see a table, you say, okay, that table's great. I'd like that underlying data, please. Sometimes agencies like to send you a scanned PDF of a tab of tabular data instead of an, you know, an XLS or a CSV file. That That's really not supposed to happen under the law, but in experience, inexperienced for a lot of folks that that does happen and if you request something in a certain format the law says you should be able to get it in that format particularly if you know that that record was data it was created in a database if it's data you should be able to get it as data not a scanned pdf file um, and agencies if they have to use programming to retrieve the data they're not allowed to charge you for that if it's data in the first place. Um, something that folks often experience is, you know, yes, you can get this record, but it'll cost you, you know, $200 for the staff time to retrieve this information. If it's data and they can just pulling it out of the databases of the agency, they're not supposed to charge you for that. And again, as I mentioned earlier, there are certain types of records um, where the record itself might not be disclosable, but some of the underlying data would be. So just keep in mind there's different exceptions. I have a really lengthy list of tips of how to do freedom of information law request. And um, there's a handout that summarizes some of them, but I'm just going to go through them briefly. I'm not going to read them verbatim just to keep it, keep it moving here. So I would suggest if you have never done a freedom of information law request, it probably feels pretty and that's most of you in the room, right? Okay, there's some new people since I asked that question at the beginning. Who has done a Freedom of Information request before? Okay, a few, a few people. It's a good idea to find a template, make your own boilerplate, and there is a committee on open government that has a sample request. So you can absolutely use this and um, have it be the base for your request. You don't have to develop something from scratch. Um, Agencies are required to list out the types of files that they have. The Freedom of Information Law actually says that they have to tell you what subject matter, the lists, lists of documents they have by subject matter. Um, request things in electronic format if you know it's an electronic format. That's really important. You actually should just straight up say it in your request. Otherwise, it might get overlooked. Um, it's important to think ahead because... If you're looking at data, you're often looking at things in defined chunks of time. You know, I want a quarterly report. I want all the data from this year. If you are if you want to request something continually, just think ahead about it. Like if you know that that's something you're going to want to get, if it's a quarterly report, just, you know, send that FOIL request every quarter um, just so you can be prepared. And try to be as narrow as possible in your request. Um, and sometimes people will request a bunch of things all at once in a freedom of information request. I would suggest rather than doing like, I want 10 different documents, just do separate requests. It makes it easier. You can track it easier. Um, and if it involves multiple agencies, um, if a record is say something between this agency and that agency, re request it from both. Never hurts. Um, there's a lot of timelines in the law. And I think it's important to keep organized and make yourself aware of the different deadlines that you know you have as someone who's requesting the information and what you can expect from the agencies. Um, this is all in the handout that I sent out too. And I'm sure we'll try to make this presentation available to you too. But 
I would say, you know, put some calendar alerts up on your Google calendar or your other calendar of when you expect this information to be sent to you. There's something called a constructive denial under case law. If an agency just never responds to you, they don't even acknowledge the request. Um, they take months and months. They keep sending you extensions. That's considered a denial. And that, you can use that to your advantage because that can trigger what's called an appeal. And you can appeal for records um, if you think you've been denied, either because the agency straight out told you you can't get this record or because they just are taking forever and sending you in an extension letter, you can um, appeal that. And I think it's important to keep track of the timeline for that reason. Hi. Um, one question that folks often have that I think is important is, you know, again, this gets to the question of, do you have to be a lawyer <laughs> to do this? The answer is no. But if you are a lawyer or you have friends who are lawyers or your organization or your employer has lawyers available to you, you should absolutely consider suing if an agency doesn't provide a record to you. I think it's actually very important for the reason that, you know, we've heard in practice from organizations that, you know, do have lawyers on staff that as soon as it's called an Article 78 proceeding. As soon as that goes through, the records start flowing. So you may then ask, well, then, you know, the next question may be, well, who can who can help me if I don't have a lawyer? Who can do this pro bono? And um, I've got some suggestions for you on um, some folks that can help out on that. So um, this process is bad. <laughs> It's not fun. I don't think, uh, you know, folks generally like submitting FOIL requests, knowing that New York, I kind of opened at the beginning saying, if you can do this in New York, you can probably do it in many other states. I will say, rest assured, there are people trying to make the freedom of information law better in New York. Um, Reinvent Albany is one of those groups. Um, I was just up in Albany for Sunshine Week, and we have a package of bills we're trying to get passed in the legislature to make the freedom of information law stronger. So rest assured, we're working on it. So here I mentioned, um, if you don't have a lawyer, <laughs> how how can I get help? It's a very important question. Um, I think these organizations are really important to, to keep in mind. So the New York State Committee on Open Government was created specifically to help the public to help agencies understand the freedom of information law. They do a lot of work on the state open meetings law as well. They have attorneys on staff. You can call them up and ask them questions and they're very nice and they'll help. <laughs> Both questions about, you know, say you do put in a freedom of information request and it's not going anywhere or you do get denied. They can help walk you through some of the issues and um, they're a resource that is there for everybody. And I think um, not everybody knows they even exist. So uh, that's first step. Um, there are some different clinics out there. A lot of them are used by the press, right? Is anyone here from the press? Are you all advocates? You're a reporter? Awesome. Okay. Um, a lot, there's a lot of resources for reporters. There's a lot of organizations. There's Reporters Committee is um, a national group. There's these First Amendment clinics that help reporters specifically on pro bono cases. Unfortunately, it's a little harder on the advocacy side, I would say, um, to get pro bono help. But these types of clinics are really important because they can, you know, even if they can't represent you, they can give you some legal advice. I hope you don't even have to sue. I hope you all just get your records that are just public records. But if it gets to that point, I think it's important to uh, to be prepared. Um, this is a QR code for the handout that I sent around. So you have it in electronic format because there's a lot of links in there. And links on a printed um, document don't help you so much. Um, 
I went through my slides way faster than I thought I would. So I think it would be awesome to have a discussion and have you ask me any questions about the freedom of information law and tips and how to make it better. So because you're here because you wanted to learn. So I want to hear from you all about the questions you have, the experiences you've had, or, you know, help you feel better about this process and make it easier for you. So does anybody have a question? Okay. Um, you in the back. I think you were first. Yeah. What is sunshine? <laughs> oh, sure. Sure. <laughs> um, so Sunshine Week is a national, uh, I would call it a holiday, but it is not federally recognized. But it's a, it's a week where reporters and advocates highlight transparency laws throughout the country and the importance of them. Um, so the freedom of information law, I think I mentioned, you know, that's the that's what it's called in New York, but there's similar laws all over the country. There's the Federal Freedom of Information Act. Other states have things called Open Records Acts. And it's it's a week where there's different activity around the country just pushing the need for open records and freedom of information. And that's that's what Sunshine Week is. I have a question about the uh, private or PII exception to responses. Uh, New York is one of the few, if not the only state in the country that allows an individual or an entity to file a FOIL request for the voter file, yeah. which includes a crap ton of PII yes. for anyone on the voter roll. Uh, can you speak to how the legislature has reconciled that? exception with that availability of yeah hi yeah no it's it's an important question um something i didn't get at is that there's a whole separate um let's see i'm gonna go backwards here there's a whole separate section of law that's you know about personal information and what is protected um under new york state law and it's it's really meant that you know your medical records your <laughs> all sorts of records are not available for just, you know, anyone to use. And I think the biggest concern is that they're used for commercial purposes, right? You don't want to get mailings from people. But, you know, it, it, what's also interesting is that there's a lot of open data out there with people's personal information that not everybody is even aware of. You know, you can go on the New York City property records and find people's home addresses. Not everybody knows that. But uh, I would say that, you know, there is the freedom of information law and there's the personal, you know, privacy laws. And then there's every other section of state law that might make its own rules about a particular set of data. And the voter files are one of those. So how the legislature rationalizes that, I do not know. But I think if there's any time the legislature wants to pass a law about a particular type of document, record, data set, database, it may put in place different rules that are completely not the same as the Freedom of Information Law just for that record. Um, it's, you know, I would say the Freedom of Information Law is a guide, <laughs> so is the privacy laws, but there are always quirks. And I think the voter files are a very important example of a quirk, um, of a type of personal record that you can get that is, you know, if it were a different type of personal record, you would never be able to get it. So, yeah, I don't, I hope, I can't justify, you know, the rationale of the legislature on that one, but that's what I know. I mean, I, so I have a couple of different questions for you. Yeah. Um, no, in terms of subscribing for, um, I guess, specific, um, requests that require an agency to to do more work beyond the programming. Yeah. Why is reasonably? And then why is just absolutely pretty? And it's this is a really tricky question. Um, because the law, I didn't get into this, um, the law does allow agencies to charge you for the preparation of records. I mentioned the one specific exemption or exception is that, you know, if it's data 
if they have to use programming to pull it out, then they can't charge you for that for preparation. It is such a case-by-case -case thing. Some agencies never charge anybody, and other ch agencies do. Um, and I think, unfortunately, it sometimes gets used as a way to stonewall people and to make it inaccessible um, for journalists, members of the public, to get a record because it's it's a barrier that the law allows and it's completely, you know, up to the agency if they want to use it or not. Um, something I didn't get to in my presentation, I mentioned it a little bit. We we look at the we've looked at the logs of different agencies, state agencies, to see how many people request freedom of information, um, how many people put in requests for freedom of information every year. What do agencies do in response? It's so varied. The Board of Elections, you mentioned voter files, they're the fastest agency for turning around freedom of information requests. Like who would have thought the Board of Elections would be amazing, but their average response time is like four days. Why, right? That's like incredible to me. And then other agencies, um, one that I looked at their FOIA logs for is Empire State Development. And a specific thing that they had in many of their responses to people requesting records was a charge. <laughs> I couldn't see how much they were charged from me looking as an outsider at their log of requests. But I can tell you that, you know, it was journalists requesting records. They were sent what would be the bill. And then they dropped the request in every single case. In every single case, the journalists dropped the request. Empire State Development. So it's um, unfortunately allowed in the law and I think unfortunately abused by some agencies. And um, I have direct knowledge of that with at least one agency from looking at, um, yeah, for literally every single time they said there would be um, the, the, the request, the inquiry was closed because no one wanted to pay, you know, the hundreds of dollars that were being requested. So that kind of follows up to my next question. Um, when you do an appeal, what exactly happens? It, it, do you have to appeal with um, your legal um, advisor or can you just appeal if you like, no, I don't, I don't want to say that. And... Yeah, yeah. Um, so once an agency sends you a response, you know, they maybe they deny you or maybe they send you a record and half of it's blacked out and you want to appeal because you didn't get what you wanted, right? You didn't get what you asked for. You have to send an appeal within 30 days. Otherwise, you lose the chance. That's what the law requires. Um, and that's calendar days rather than... Um, I'm just going to get there. Yeah. It's calendar days. Um, you know, if you have a lawyer <laughs> to help you look at it, I would suggest having them take a look um, because often the reason, you know, when an agency denies you a freedom of information request, they're supposed to explain why. They're supposed to say what e exemption they're using. Um, this is actually a, l a law that passed not too long ago um, where they have to explain why the request was denied. So if it's been denied um, and you think the reason is bogus or you disagree, you know, that's the type of thing that you would address in an appeal. And you have to do that within 30 days. Um, you could also talk to the Committee on Open Government about it, you know, if you don't have a lawyer, because they're the type of group, you know, they're, that's what they're there for, is to help provide advice. Um, another quirk that I think is important to know is that you have to send the appeal to the right person. <laughs> So by law, the staff member at the agency who handled your FOIL request is not supposed to be the person you send the appeal to. Agencies have posted on their websites who to appeal to. I would say most of the time when I see an appeal, um, information about who to appeal to listed, it's an actual physical address with no email, <laughs> which is frustrating, right? 
Um, so, you know, you could try to call the agency and get an actual human or an actual email address, or you could send your snail mail if you really want. But um, that appeals are a little bit quirky in that you have to send it to the right person. Because sometimes I've heard anecdotally that the agency will claim, well, we never got the appeal because you sent it to the wrong person. We never got it. So it's just a quirk to keep in mind. And then um, they have to respond to you in 10 days. Um, I, you know, we don't tend to do, you know, we don't do, we don't sue after because we don't have the resources. We're a small nonprofit. But I will say that I have found that at least half the time, if I do an appeal and I, you know, try to have a reasonable answer for why I think they're wrong, about half the time I get what I'm looking for. So it is absolutely worth doing. Um, and I think it is important also from the perspective that it um, it shows you're serious. And if you do want to sue, you have to appeal. So if you if you appeal, they might be like, oh, maybe they have a lawyer. I better I better respond to this. So that was my long answer on appeals, but I'm glad you asked that question because it, it you know, it gave me some time to explain that process to everybody. Um, yes. So I had seen something, I forget exactly where, about um, somebody was sending FOIL requests for the database schema um, for you know, various agency databases. And it was sort of a phishing expedition in that they, they didn't actually know what data those agencies had. Um, and so what they wanted to know is like, what are all the tables in your database? What are the names of all the tables? <laughs> what are the columns in the tables? Uh, which is there's no there's no propri proprietary information there, so you should be able to yeah. get it. But uh, that person was running into a, a lot of agencies that were saying, I think this was actually in Ohio. I don't think this this was in New York. Yeah. State. But um, they were having this situation where they would say that's uh, uh, covered under the uh, security. Mm -hmm. exemption like oh that would be it would be useful for hackers to know our database table names do i know of anything similar do you know of any any effort any successful requests for stuff like that in, in the yeah. um i can say that my colleague who's not in the room not tom and a different colleague tried to get the basically a website organization, you know, because we were trying to determine for a particular agency, you know, basically we were trying to get kind of like the navigation and, you know, internal stuff about what an agency had on its website because we wanted to understand the types of records that were posted on its website and we got denied flat out. And it's not exactly the same thing as a database schema, but, um, the other, the thing that they might tell you in New York, if I were to put my head, you know, if I were to try to put myself inside the head of this agency in New York, is that they might say that that is not a record. <laughs> you know, it's asking them to create a record that doesn't exist. I'm not sure if that's true or not. I'm not a technical, you know, I'm not a programmer, so I can't say, but. I, I think that that would be a hard thing in New York to get. I just, yeah. But it's an interesting point. Um, it, the, in New York City, um, I think, were you all at the opening presentation when Noel mentioned the data directory? So there's actually, you know, a requirement in New York City that agencies have a data directory. So in New York City, you could ask for the directory of all the data per the data directory. Whether agencies are doing that or not is a different story. So in New York City, you might have a lot better luck at the state level. I just, yeah, I think that would be be difficult, but um, more plausible that you get something in, in New York City. Yeah. So I hate to start anything like this, not a question, more of just like a comment or other, a couple of other resources that might be useful. One of them would be, I work at the Independent Budget Office in New York City, and there's also the Authorities Budget Office um, for New York State. So I'm thinking about like <clears throat> economic development corporations, 
this is across the state. And so while like essentially IBO at least has access to a lot of particularly city budget data and sometimes we get access to other information that we wouldn't necessarily be providing records, but we will do analysis on behalf of the public. So if you're interested in like, for example, a, a question we get a lot, which is something that like, we're still working on is like, what is the budget for the BHRD program, which is like the mobile sort of crisis response um, through 911. Um, and like, there's no like city record that like plays that out, it would seem, um, but like we're trying to do analysis with the data that we have and the data we have access to, to like put that together for people. So I would say like, if you are interested in anything like budget related, New York City, you can always email us but also like related to like any public authority is the um like authorities budget office and they also have information that people are looking for um, yeah. yeah now i i think it's a really good point that you know was in my tips list that i breezed over because i was trying to uh not bore you all with a laundry list of things i i think it's really important to make sure it's not publicly available somewhere already and you just haven't found it because you know you might you know in principle yes if it's a public record they should always be able to provide it to you by you know the freedom of information law even if it's a report that's already published on their website you can use foil as a tool to help you find something that's just buried on a government website somewhere if you can't find it you can use it as a tool but <laughs> You're going to save yourself a lot of trouble if you can not even use frame of information law in the first place, either by, you know, going to resources like the Independent Budget Office, Authorities Budget Office. You know, there there are government agencies that, you know, respond very nicely to, you know, public inquiries, you know, there are press offices, there are public information officers at every agency, and you could call them up and ask them, you know, get a human on the phone <laughs> and ask them what is even available. I mean, sometimes they may tell you, oh, you have to foil that. But I think that's, it's an important point that you should just, before you go down that road of filing a foil request, make sure it's not available somewhere else buried and you just couldn't find it. So... Ask all your awesome nerd friends um, if they're aware if it exists on a uh, government website somewhere and you haven't found it yet. That's a very important and good point. So I liked your statement. Statements are fine. Um, and I would I would love to hear actually um, people's experience who do FOIL. I would love to hear from you all too and for you to share with others um, if you feel comfortable doing so because... It can, you know, it can be really, really different types of information that, you know, me as a, you know, advocate in a watchdog group, I look at different types of agencies than you all do, you know, so I may not be looking for the same types of records. So I would love to hear, uh, not to put anyone on the spot, but your own personal experiences and um, things that you might be able to offer to everyone in the room, too, if anyone feels like sharing. Please do. I've got a story but from not the investor side, but the answering side. So, yeah, I'm like early where I became a requester, I worked with this, when a chief boy officer in a federal agency at the Department of Housing for the Development. And at the time, what the news story was the then Secretary of Transportation, Elaine Chow, it, somebody had divulged, it became public knowledge that she had spent a lot of money on hair styling and makeup and grooming mm -hmm. for her public appearances. And so a number of news outlets and requesters sent out FOIA requests to the secretary's offices of pretty much every cabinet agency, including ours. And at the time, the secretary was Alfonso Jackson, who, if anybody remembers, was as bald as a cue ball. <laughs> And so we didn't quite, of course, like we didn't have any records that were responsive, but the uh, chief FOIA counsel, I think wanting to be a bit snarky, had kind of found, um, uh, I guess, a bit of language to include in there that they should do their research to see if this kind of thing would even be 
available? Like, does a guy with no hair really require grooming? So there's a personal, I think some people on the request door side, uh, the, the request e side, they do get a little frustrated at what it can sometimes seem like an endless stream of futile requests or stupid requests, essentially what they were thinking, um, which is obviously not to excuse their duty to respond. But I think it's important to remember that there are always humans with human limitations on the other ends of those requests. Yes, obviously, I opened this up as an advocate and speaking to a room of people that you're here because I want to help you get government records. But yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right. And I, I think that um, I mentioned, you know, we just put out a report out on FOIL logs of agencies looking at, it's called listening to FOIL. I should probably pull it up here. Um, but it, uh, you know, looked at the requests of different agencies and tried to help, you know, explain, you know, the caseloads. And it, there's a huge amount of requests that people get. Um, you know, the MTA gets 3,000 requests a year. They get a ridiculous amount of requests for um, video footage of bus crashes, video footage of people, you know, trips and falls inside the subway system from lawyers who want to get money. It's it's hard, you know, they get a ridiculous amount of FOIL requests and it's, it's, you know, th these are the, you know, some of the stats. Um, and they have a really hard time closing them all. You know, when they can close a request, it takes them not a lot of time, but then they, they can just be open for years. Um, whereas other agencies, you know, it's pretty cut and dry and they don't get that many requests every year and they can pretty much close them all. So I, it's it's really variable, kind of depending on the agency you're looking at. Um, so I do have sympathy for the MTA FOIL staff. And it's not the FOIL staff's fault that there's only one of them, you know, maybe. Maybe a small agency has literally one Freedom of Information Law staff member, and they can't possibly handle the volume of requests. Um, and I think this, this points to a, a problem just that we're not really studying the freedom of information law and how it works in New York. One of the bills that's in the package that, that I mentioned earlier about um, that we had at Sunshine Week would just require every single agency in the state to send to the Committee on Open Government their log of requests. So we'd know how many requests does each agency get? How long does it take to close these FOIL requests? Because then you could look at staffing and say, okay, that agency needs some help you know, governor, can you fund some more FOIL staff at that agency? Because they can't keep up with the, the caseload. Um, you know, I, I brought this up in part two because COLIG is the Commission on Ethics and Lobbying Government. Just no one probably knows that acronym whatsoever. But COLIG, they, um, they don't get a ton of requests every year. It's like 200. And most of them are for um, financial disclosure statements for like the head of the MTA um, is a very common one, for example, the board members of some. So these are public officials and people want to know, reporters want to know who else do they work for, like board members of organizations. Um, a third of the requests that they got were from someone who was trying to stick it to the agency who used to work for them. And uh, a third of their requests were from someone who is looking to make a point. So um, some states call us a vexatious requester and they can actually um, kind of blacklist that person for making freedom of information requests. We don't think that's good policy just generally because how do you determine who's vexatious and who's not? Um, it seems arbitrary and really hard to manage. Um, but it's true. There are certain requests that get made um, by individuals who have an axe to grind, um, and they can slow down the process. And I, you know, I I've seen it in the data for particular agencies. Um, I also have a funny example of you know we I've looked at the FOIL request logs for the MTA quite a lot. It's an agency that we care about a lot, and there's a certain very 
a well-respected reporter who made like 15 requests at three in the morning one day. <laughs> like, whoa, okay. So they, they get a lot of requests and I do, I do have sympathy. So, you know, I think it's important for you all to know, I mean, that the freedom of information law is there as a tool. It's there to ensure that you have access to government information. Um, and it was, you know, something that was put together in the seventies when we didn't have the internet, everything, you know, in our view, if it's a public record, it should be online in the first place. So you don't have to make these requests, but it's just, it's a tool and it's an important tool to keep in the back of your mind that you can use at any time. Um, so that's, that's what I would say, but you make a really interesting point about, you know, what about the agency side of things? So I do have some sympathy for them. Um, and actually this report, it might be, um, worth flagging something too, and that people don't kind of realize that, you know, who requests information. I, I mentioned ESD earlier. A lot, you know, it's not just advocates who ask for information. Um, there's a lot of business entities that are interested. You know, this is Empire State Development. They they give out grants to businesses. They give out, you know, tax credits. A lot of businesses are requesting records. Um, a lot of law firms request records for clients. So there's there's a lot of stuff that comes in. It's not all from reporters and advocates who are, you know, fighting the good fight as, you know, we like to think. People who have, you know, business interests with the state or, you know, people requesting their own private information or former employees of an agency may be requesting records about their employment history with an agency. There's so many different reasons that people um, request information from the government and, you know, advocates and, you know, data analysts are just a tiny slice of that whole picture. Um, say that the Port Authority has a very nice uh, oil portal and they actually have the, you know, all of the, the fulfilled oil requests <laughs> available for anybody to search, uh, which is something that would be really fantastic if other agencies did that. Um, yeah, I have that highlighted in our report, yeah. <laughs> so I can pull it up right now. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is a, who would have thought that the uh, Port Authority, who had the lovely Bridgegate scandal and, you know, is a paradigm of transparent government, but yes. So if you request something through the Port Authority, they, they're a weird agency, just to flag, because they are a bi-state entity, so they're in New York or in New Jersey, they're not, they're, they're subject to both and none of the laws at the same time. They have their own open records policy. So they kind of can do what they want in some ways, which is interesting. And they chose to proactively publish um, requests that were granted. And this is for anything that's a public record. So you can see right here, requests for maintenance records for escalators at Newark Penn Station. If anyone wants to know, you can, <laughs> you can find that now. Um, and I, I think, yeah, this is, they're definitely an example of a best practice. Um, and, you know, I think something that's interesting too that some agencies are doing is they're using freedom of information requests to then say, okay, well, 10 people requested the same contract or the same report. We should probably put that on our website. It's just, you know, it's a best practice to really look at what you are releasing through the Freedom of Information Law and then determining what you put online. Um, and New York City's open data law was actually, um, it was a change that was made after it was first passed, is that agencies are supposed to look at their freedom of, city agencies are supposed to look at their Freedom of Information requests, and if there's data that is being requested that should or could potentially go on the open data portal, that gets put in a tracker. And so you can actually go and see, you know, this agency has these certain data sets that, you know, they identified as commonly requested through the Freedom of Information Law, and they should probably be posted as open data. So um, requesting data <laughs> through the Freedom of Information Law in New York City, if it's not on the open data portal, is actually a good idea from the perspective that it may help 
prompted to become open data later on by the agency. So that's the reason why you should FOIL, <laughs> at the city level especially, um, for data, because you'll put it into that pipeline to get it um, published. Um, one thing, since we have a little more time, has anyone who does FOILs, have you FOILed the state recently, or do you mostly do city? So the state switched to this new platform called GovQA, and what's interesting is that you know, it's, it's a third-party FOIL processing um, site. And what's interesting is that it's the same that's used in other places. And this is King County in Washington State. And they actually publish all their requests as well that were fulfilled uh, open records requests. And New York State is using the exact same software <laughs> as Washington County, so literally all they do have to do is turn on the feature and fulfilled FOIL requests could go online in New York State. It's something we're pushing and trying to get the uh, state to adopt because they've bought this platform for all the agencies to use and they just have to turn on that feature and uh, we hope they do. You like Chrissy Elena, but which Oh, yeah, 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 what the record looks like. Yeah. Oh, wow, some of these are interesting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the details of the animal can control, okay. Uh, let's, wow, these are, okay, let's, full release, let's go to that one because that looks like it's something that would actually be published. So, <clears throat> yeah, it looks like you can then go in yeah, yeah, that's all zip files. I don't, what am I doing opening these on my desktop? Do I trust Washington County? <clears throat> yeah, but I guess it's an example. Maybe I should go to the Port Authority. That's a little closer to home, right? Um, let's look at the maintenance records of Newark Penn. That sounds more fun. Um, so this is the response. It's actually th from the Port Authority. Um, this is interesting in that it's, uh, this is the copy of the communications between, okay, this isn't actually the record. This is the copy of the, of the communications between um, the individual who was looking for the records. It's not always cut and dry, is it? So... Anyone else have one? Do you want me to try? <laughs> That's possible. Let's see. Ooh, bus project awarded contract document. This might be a little bit more exciting. Let's see. And because it's a contract document, it's going to take five minutes to load. Okay, there you go. So um, this is actually something interesting that the Port Authority does too. They have this sort of checkoff. So when they're responding to your freedom of information requests, they kind of have a standard template um, of how they respond to you. And so they're saying they are making this available and it's a 420 page contract, which is published on the Port Authority's website. So between robotic research and the Port Authority. So, yeah. So there's, yeah, I, unfortunately, this is not common practice in New York. I wish we had this, but it's true. If you're ever looking for something from the Port Authority, um, you might want to look through that portal. Um, and I, it's actually, you know, in some ways, a pretty big deal that uh, contracts are being published too, because they're some of the toughest records to get from my experience. They just take a lot of time. They might be heavily redacted. Um, so yeah, I think it's a good example. Okay. Anybody else have? Yes, please. Next question. So for example, are you sending these like requests if you're gonna get, um, I don't know, a paper copy of something? I don't, I don't know if that's also something 
um, that many people do. But if you are going to do that, um, would you send that to your home or would you send that to your organization? So if you don't know how long you're going to stay at your organization. <laughs> no, I, that, that's actually an interesting point that um, it, it takes a long time to get certain types of records. You know, some things are really easy to get. Some things are contract could take you six months. It could take you a year. Yeah, I, I think it's worth... Uh, <laughs> Some people ask for stuff through their personal email all the time. Um, I mean, at the same time, I would say if you are, you know, agencies aren't really supposed to look at who's requesting in terms of how they respond to you. I mean, that's not, doesn't say anything to law about preferential treatment for X reporter versus X general member of the public. But having your organization might give you a little more like, oh, that reporter's asking for this. We better respond or you know, if you work for a nonprofit that they might now, I think it could go either way, frankly, you know, um, you might want to, yeah, use your judgment on that one. But it, it's a very interesting point, though, I think that uh, I would encourage people to use their affiliation, because it becomes a data point in the um, FOIA log itself. I'm probably one of very few people that looks at FOIA logs, but it would help you know, the agency understand who's making the requests and then maybe do a better job responding to that constituency. So I would encourage you to do it through your professional organization unless, I don't know, if you want to quit your job, that's, I guess, a different era issue. <laughs> I can't give career advice, unfortunately. So, cool. In terms of the budget, have you done any oil results? Because my understanding is it's very old and even the legislators themselves, when I speak to them, are not aware of what's in the budget at the time that it's being negotiated. Is there, a, is there a way to find out what's happening in conference, or I think one legislator in city council said the budget negotiating team, is there like meeting records available for those types of things? So you're talking about city council? And also the state would. State legislature, you would not be able to get that at all. I'm totally convinced that that would not be accessible because conference is like an internal deliberation. And yeah, that's, I'm pretty sure, exempt in their own rules. <laughs> you know, they don't even let staff in the room for some of those. I, I used to be a legislator staffer, so I can I can say that. I, they didn't always let staff in the room. This At the state level, you, you can't get that type of and if it's part of a deliberation or a deliberative process that sometimes fits in that interagency exemption, if it's not a final, if it's not if it's not final, it's something that's being negotiated. You, it's generally not a record that's easily accessible. It's a final determination. Um, however, I would say that I've had something as a watchdog group. We've often tried to get agreements that are reached after the budget because sometimes there are big pots of money in the state budget that get decided later <laughs> flush funds they are decided through mous if we've had to do foil requests in some cases for you know pots of money that are not allocated until later and unfortunately you know that's not something that's required proactively to be disclosed and at the city council level I mean, you could certainly try to to do a, a FOIL request for some of those records, but I think if it's not a final decision, if it's part of a negotiation, you're not going to have much luck, unfortunately. You've got to find someone who is in the room. That's <laughs> unfortunately the key. So, okay. Well, let's, time is up, and uh, I guess the happy hour is starting. So. Okay.